para dar inicio a esta ceremonia, me gustaría invitar a la trila la profesora Matilde Schwalb, directora del Centro de Liderazgo, Ética y Responsabilidad Social de nuestra Casa de Estudios. Adelante, por favor. Buenas noches. Tengan todos ustedes, señoras y señores. En nombre de la Universidad del Pacífico, del Centro de Liderazgo, Ética y Responsabilidad Social que me toca dirigir, es un placer darles la bienvenida a esta conferencia internacional y ceremonia de nombramiento por la trayectoria y el reconocimiento del trabajo del profesor Pierre Chandon. Eh, quisiera empezar agradeciendo al profesor Chandon por aceptar nuestra invitación y a las autoridades de la Universidad del Pacífico que creyeron en esta propuesta y permitieron que las cosas fluyan. Quiero agradecer en particular a Cintia Sanborn, quien apoyó desde el Vicerrectorado de Investigación que le tocó asumir en esos momentos el tema de la alimentación saludable como línea de investigación y nos acompañó a lo largo de este proceso que hoy culmina con el reconocimiento al profesor Chandón. También quiero agradecer a David Mayorga, entonces vicerrector académico, y a Marta Chávez, entonces decana de la Facultad de Ciencias Empresariales, y que hoy nos acompaña, por el respaldo que ambos dieron a esta iniciativa. No puedo dejar de mencionar a Felipe Portocarrero, nuestro flamante rector, quien hoy nos acompaña. Gracias, Felipe, por estar hoy día con nosotros. La presencia de Pierre Chandón hoy y aquí no es producto del azar ni de la improvisación, sino más bien el resultado de un largo y planificado trabajo que comenzamos desde nuestro Centro de Liderazgo, Ética y Responsabilidad Social hace casi tres años, cuando identificamos un serio problema de larga data que decidimos convertir en oportunidad de intervención para nuestro centro, el impacto del consumo de alimentos procesados en la salud del consumidor. Problema que por su magnitud se ha convertido hoy en un tema de salud pública y continúa siendo parte del debate nacional. La industria de alimentos procesados, también llamados industrializados, ha respondido de manera muy conveniente a las exigencias de la vida moderna, que demanda alimentos preparados, listos para comer o que requieren un mínimo de esfuerzo de preparación. Son relativamente baratos, de agradable sabor y están disponibles casi en cualquier lugar. Pero a la par de estos beneficios que la población hoy disfruta, la producción y consumo de alimentos procesados están generando otros efectos no deseados en la salud de la población, al mismo tiempo que agregan una carga importante a la huella ambiental del planeta. Cuando en 2013 se promulgó la controvertida Ley de Promoción de la Alimentación Saludable para niños, niñas y adolescentes, y ante el reclamo que se le hacía al marketing de promover la obesidad entre los consumidores, y especialmente entre los niños y adolescentes, alcanzando incluso a la población desnutrida, nos preguntamos, ¿y qué culpa tiene el marketing? Pues hoy, seis años después, nos respondemos, si bien no se puede culpar al marketing de la obesidad y de todos los males que se derivan de los males, malos hábitos alimenticios de la población, estamos convencidos de que el marketing tiene los conocimientos, los medios y el poder, no solamente para mitigar estos daños, sino también para contribuir significativamente a mejorar la satisfacción del consumidor y la calidad de vida de la población en general. El marketing estudia al consumidor y sabe cómo hacer para lograr determinadas respuestas. El marketing sabe, por ejemplo, cuál es el nivel de sal, azúcar y grasa que más placer sensorial produce en el consumidor y conoce las características organolépticas que deben estar presentes para lograr la respuesta deseada del consumidor. El marketing sabe dónde y cómo presentar los productos para que tengan mayor probabilidad de ser elegidos. Sabe cómo anunciar los precios para que estos no sean un obstáculo para favorecer la elección del, del producto. Y también sabe cuál es la forma de empaque preferida por el consumidor y qué tipo de información la que más impacta en sus decisiones de compra. En suma, el marketing sabe 
cómo influir en las decisiones de compra del consumidor. Ahora queremos que el marketing use ese conocimiento y todo su poder y medios a su alcance para que contribuya no solo a la satisfacción sensorial e inmediata del consumidor, sino también a la salud y bienestar a largo plazo. Por eso elegimos a Adrede, al profesor Chandón, y lo invitamos para que comparta con nosotros los resultados de su trabajo de investigación sobre el marketing de alimentos procesados. Además, lo elegimos porque estamos seguras de que los intereses comunes que hemos descubierto en materia de investigación significan una oportunidad de trabajo conjunta con nuestro departamento de marketing. Así esperamos que a través de nuestro Consumer Lab podamos experimentar y medir los impactos que tendría en el consumidor la implementación de nuevas prácticas de marketing que tengan en cuenta los efectos no deseados y de largo plazo de sus estrategias comerciales. En suma, el trabajo del profesor Chandón responde al interés de nuestro centro por aportar desde la disciplina del marketing a la mejora del bienestar del consumidor a partir de un mejor marketing, es decir, de un marketing más responsable que se haga cargo no solamente de sus impactos, sino también de sus actos. Muchas gracias por su atención. Vamos a escuchar ahora a la profesora Carla Penano, vicedecana de Marketing, quien nos va a presentar la semblanza académica de nuestro invitado. Dear Dr. Felipe Portocarrero, President of Pacifico University, Dear Dr. Marta Chavez Pasano, Academic Vice President. Dear Dr. Arlette Beltrán, Research Vice President. Dear Dr. Matilde Schwalb, Director of the CLERS, Center for Leadership, Ethics and Social Responsibility. Dear authorities, colleagues, students, and friends. It is an honor for me to present as the Associate Dean of the Marketing Program, the recognition of Dr. Pierre Chandon as an honorary professor of Pacifico University, the maximum distinction of our institution. Pierre Chandon is the L'Oreal Chair Professor of Marketing, Innovation and Creativity at INSEAD in France and the Director of the INSEAD Sorbonne University Behavioral Lab. He holds a PhD in Marketing from HEC Paris and a Master in Science in Business Administration from ESSEC. When I was appointed to write this presentation, inevitably I reflected upon the importance and relevance of Professor Chandon's designation, both for our marketing program, our university, and why not, our country as a whole. Our mission at Pacifico University is to form responsible leaders for the world. And I believe with Professor Chandon's distinction and incorporation as honorary professor of our university, we are in fact contributing to this mission. This especially in the current complex times we are living in regards to obesity and public health. Obesity is a serious and growing crisis in public health all over the world. The World Health Organization estimates that worldwide, the prevalence of obesity has nearly tripled between 1975 and 2016. There are around 2 billion adults overweight and of those, 650 million are considered to be affected by obesity. That equates to 39% of adults over 18 who are overweight and 13% who are obese. If current trends continue, it is estimated that 2.7 billion adults will be overweight, over 1 billion affected by obesity, and 177 million adults severely affected by obesity by 2025, according to the World Obesity Federation 2018. The prevalence of obesity across the world continues to rise, and this is now recognized as one of the most important public health problems facing the world today, according to the World Obesity Federation. This problem requires, requires urgent attention, action, and programs that provide a solution. It also requires more and better research programs 
both from the academia and corporations, in order to understand in depth this phenomenon and come up with ways to hopefully solve it. One of the pioneers and most recognized researchers that have investigated this topic is Dr. Pierre Chandon, who in 2012 was recognized with the American Market Association White's Winner Odell Award for the article entitled, Is Obesity Caused by Calorie Underestimation? A Psycho Psychophysical Model of Meal Size Estimation, published in the Journal of Marketing Research. The AMA Foundation champions individual marketeers who are making an impact in our profession and community. This award recognizes research that has made the most significant long-term contribution to marketing theory, methodology, and or practice, distinguishing marketing visionaries who have elevated the field and supports the next generation of marketeers who will transform the, pro the profession. At Pacifico University, we as authorities strive to achieve just that. We want to be able to educate, form, inspire and transform the next generation of marketeers who will in turn transform the profession and contribute to make the world a better, more sustainable place for the future generations. We want to inspire our students and professors and have them follow your example by continuing and extending research on relevant and important topics in marketing. When getting to know Professor Chandon through his work and finding details in order to write this dissertation about his professional trajectory, I question myself on where to start. Should I highlight his intense and enriching academic contributions? Should I emphasize his long and fruitful teaching experience? Should I mention his appreciated and valued participation in the management of institutions, both in private and public sectors, or should I focus on his admirable humane qualities? I realized in doing so that it is impossible to separate who he is as an academic from the outstanding t researcher, husband, colleague, human being, father, to the wonderful leader and inspiring teacher in many institutions all over the world. Professor Chandon has built a very enriching life, both as an academic, professor, researcher, as a professional in the, in the academic and corporate world, and as a citizen and human being, and truly represents what is meant by our mission statement, a responsible leader for the world. I would like to share with you a few of his important contributions in the diverse roles he has been appointed to accomplish. Dr. Pierre Chandon studied in ESSEC Graduate School of Management in Sergi Pontoise, France, where he obtained a degree in business administration in 1992. Then, in 1993, he obtained a master in marketing with honors from Université Paris Dauphin, I hope, Paris, France. He then obtained a PhD in marketing with the highest honors from Heck School of Management, France in 1998. He is, since 2012, the L'Oreal Chair Professor in Marketing, Innovation and Creativity at, its, at INSET, Fontainebleau, France. Prior to joining INSET, Pierre Chandon was Assistant Professor of Marketing at Harvard Business School from 2011 to 2012. He was also a visiting scholar for the marketing department at Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, from 2005 to 2006, and held a visiting position as a marketing faculty at the Kellogg Graduate School of Management, Northwestern University, from 2004 to 2005. Dr. Chandon was also a faculty of the London Business School and of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill from 1997 to 1999. Pierre Chandon studies innovative marketing solutions to better align business growth with consumer health and well-being. And his studies are recognized and valued all over the world. His especially notable contributions to the field include topics such as the effects of marketing actions on food choices, energy intake, and obesity, packaging design, package and portion size perception, and preferences, and the attention and choice at the point of purchase, merchandising. He has over 80 articles published in top international marketing journals, like the Journal of Consumer Research, the Journal of Marketing Research, the Journal of Marketing and Marketing Science, and in Psychology or Nutrition journals like Appetite, the Journal of Experimental Psychology, Nutrition Reviews, Obesity, and Psychological Science. 
Professor Shendon also holds an important role in the promotion of consumer behavior, marketing and research practices, and methodologi methodologies through the INSEAD Sorbonne Behavioral Lab. Since 2010, he has been appointed as the director of the Behavioral Lab, which offers world-class facilities and support to conduct behavioral research. Since opening in Paris in 2002, more than 100,000 people have participated in research on topics such as individual and group decision making, perception, emotion, and consumption. More than 30 faculty members and 20 PhD candidates from the Association Sorbonne University and HEC Paris currently conduct research at the lab. They are all scientific studies whose objective is to publish scientific articles, contribute to PhD dissertations, and generally increase scientific knowledge. Product of this fruitful academic career, Pierre Chandon has been distinguished with several international awards. He won the Best Article Award for the Journal of Consumer Research in 2010 and in 2014. In 2012, like I said, he received the Odell Award for the article in the Journal of Marketing Research, which was judged to, be, to have made the most significant long-term contribution to marketing. He has also twice a finalist for the Marketing Science Institute H. Paul Root Award for the best article published in the Journal of Marketing in 2006 and in 2010. His research has been the subject of media coverage worldwide by, among others, the New York Times, The Economist, The Financial Times, The Wall Street Journal, South China Morning Post, Le Monde, Cosmopolitan, but also the Daily Mail and, Co and Cosmopolitan again. Pierre Chandon is a member of the policy board of the Journal of the Association for Consumer Research, a past associate editor of the Journal of Consumer Research, and is currently on the editorial boards of the Journal of Marketing Research, Journal of Marketing, Journal of Consumer Research, Journal of Consumer Psychology, Appetite, Journal of Marketing Behavior, Recherche et Application en Marketing, Cahier de Nutrition et de Diététique, and International Journal of Research in Marketing. He has written numer numerous award-winning case studies, including the Global Best Case Award from the Case Center in 2006, 2007, 2008, 2012, and 2016. The Case Center also awarded him the Outstanding Contribution to the Case Method Prize in 2016 and the Outstanding Case Teacher Prize in 2018. According to the Case Center, he is the 10th best-selling business case author of the past 40 years. He has worked with many of the largest consumer and luxury goods companies. At INSET, Pierre Chandon teaches brand management in the MBA, EMBA, and executive education programs. He also teaches an innovative, innovative course entitled The Body Business, Understanding Food and Well-Being, in the MBA program. In 2017, he received the Dominique Ho Award for Inspiring Education Excellence at INSEAD. He was voted the best MBA elective course teacher by MBA students and has received the Dean's Commendation for Excellence in Teaching every year since its inception. With this brief summary, Professor Chandon, we want to recognize your merit and pay tribute to your dedication to cultivate knowledge and share it with the community. Together with these numerous merits and distinctions harvested along Dr. Chandon's lengthy academic and professional life, we find personal virtues that complement his achievements, such as his innovative spirit, creative personality, his willingness to serve, and need to know and explore different cultures, topics, and paths of science. Pacifica University is honored to welcome you and count you among its distinguished honorary professors, Dr. Chandon, for your professional, academic, and personal accomplishments, which are an example and a source of inspiration for our community. Thank you very much. Me gustaría invitar adelante al Dr. Chandon y a nuestro rector Felipe Portocarrero para la entrega del diploma y la imposición de la medalla de profesor honorario a nuestro distinguido invitado. Mientras el rector hace entrega del diploma y medalla al doctor Chandon, voy a dar lectura del diploma que lo acredita como profesor honorario de la Universidad del Pacífico. El Consejo Universitario de la Universidad del Pacífico, considerando que el señor doctor Pierre Chandon, en reconocimiento a la extraordinaria relevancia de sus labores 
de docencia e investigación en el campo de la mercadotecnia se ha hecho acreedor del aprecio institucional de conformidad con las disposiciones legales y reglamentarias vigentes, acuerda otorgar a su favor el nombramiento de profesor honorario como distinción especial, por lo cual extiende el presente diploma para que se le tenga y reconozca como tal. Les pido un fuerte aplauso. Y ahora sí, vamos a escuchar la conferencia de nuestro nuevo profesor honorario. Adelante. It's, um, <clears throat> I am very honored to be here tonight. Um, I apologize, I cannot uh, do this conference in Spanish, but um, I have been um, really since uh, Matilde, Carla, Susana uh, contacted me, I have been uh, dreaming about this day because um, I, um, for me it's very important that um, to be recognized uh, for the research and to be able to help and contribute with uh, colleagues around the world on this very important topic of uh, food marketing, public health. And uh, you're doing extremely good work here. You have, um, Peru is ahead of many countries. The world is looking at Peru uh, because of the innovation in the labeling laws. And for all of these reasons, and also because I am half French, half Italian, so I'm a food lover like all of you here, it's a real honor to be here with you and share some of my work. Um, so the topic of the conference is um, how do we align better food marketing, public health, but also the pleasure of eating, which is one of life's important pleasures as human beings. And uh, what I will uh, do in an hour or so we have together is um, briefly summarize, like Carla said, uh, why it's a big problem and uh, how much of the obesity problem is due to food marketing and answer some uh, important simple question of uh, is it the fault of food marketing and why can't they just sell healthier food? After that, I will talk about my research on uh, the effect of labeling laws and we'll talk a bit about what's happening in Chile and in Peru but also the new innovative approaches that I think are important as a complement to the other approaches to help better align food marketing, pleasure and health. Um, and um, let me just get started about obesity. Uh, of course, when we think about obesity, we think about the United States. And as you can see here on this map, over the years, all the different states are moving from blue to uh, red as obesity rates keep increasing, and increasing and increasing. So that today, one third of Americans are, not, uh, yeah, American citizens are obese, and uh, it's almost 50% among minorities. And the gap between the rich and poor is actually increasing. So uh, this is not just a US problem. You can see here, all the rich countries in the world, you see the trend, it's going up. Even my mother's country, Italy, which used to be one of the lowest obesity rate, is going up and childhood obesity is on the rise. It's true in France, it's true pretty much everywhere. It's not just a rich country problem. If you look at this globe here, you see uh, many countries around the world are having uh, more than a quarter of their population obese. In fact, it's a quiz I like to ask. What do you think are the three parts of the world with the highest obesity rate? Most people will say United States, but it's not true. Actually, the most affected region in the world are the Pacific Islands. Think about Samoa, Cook Islands, etc. The worst is American Samoa, where 80% of the population is obese. Because they have, you know, you've seen rugby, you see they are big people, plus American diet. And so, um, number two, is also not North America, but the Gulf countries from Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, etc. Then you have uh, Mexico and USA, and then you have places like Turkey and Egypt. So Peru is actually, uh, thank God, not among the worst uh, in terms of obesity, but like in everywhere, the rates are increasing. So it's a really a worldwide problem. It's a worldwide problem, and it is a problem that people didn't choose. 
People do not choose to be obese. People do not, uh, people, most people who are obese have tried to lose weight and failed. It's not due to some outliers who for some reason decide that it's cool to be big. It's the average person, everybody has been increasing weight because it's very easy to actually gain weight. Uh, 100 calories, which is nothing, okay, it's like a little bit of chocolate. A day is enough to gain one pound, you know, uh, half a kilo in one year. It's nothing, it's really easy. And the consequence is really big. So if you can see here, if you're in the green part, you know, which is the uh, regular weight, you know, it's fine. If you're just overweight, there are not big health issues, thank God. I'm, I'm right myself in the middle between uh, regular weight and, and overweight. It's really when you're really obese or severely obese that the problems are, and the problems are huge. You can see how being obese increases diabetes chance by nine, hypertension by three, heart attacks, etc., etc. Here's an amazing statistics. Obese children are twice more likely to die before 55 than children with regular weight. So their medical consequences are extremely, extremely severe. But beyond that, there's also all the psychosociological consequences. To make it a long story short, um, when we were thin and poor, we worshipped being big, okay? Today, we're all big and we worship being thin. Everything has changed. And it's actually very hard to be not following the norms uh, today. Um, here is a, an ad um, that says, warning, it's hard to be a little girl if you're not. Uh, and um, here's uh, some amazing statistics that I really, I still have a hard time believing. Parents give less pocket money to their obese children than to their children with a normal weight. So if the parents themselves discriminate against their own children, imagine what it feels, what it must be like to be really big. Um, I am the proud parent of, uh, uh, of uh, um, three daughters. I know I feel a lot about this, especially again, of course, uh, for, for girls. Uh, if, if you look at the media, the uh, fat people in cartoons are always the bad guys, never the heroes. Like I said, I'm the proud father of three daughters, and so I'm a world expert in Disney princesses. <laughs> I never knew, I thought, anticipated that. And you can see the princesses, they come from all hair color and eye color, etc., and from all over the world, but they are all very thin, all of them, okay? So uh, there are consequences in terms of employment, there are negative consequences in terms of social interactions, you know, uh, for example, doctors, in private uh, surveys, they acknowledge that if they have to treat a patient who is obese, they will think that's probably their fault and they deserve it. So there, beyond the medical aspect, daily life is tough. Um, and um, it impacts not just you, but the others. There's a lot of parallels with secondhand smoking because one of the best predictor of obesity is whether the mother was obese herself when the child was pregnant. So it's, the child's, it's not the child's fault at all. There is, obesity is contagious. Uh, if you have obese friends, you're more likely to become obese yourself. Uh, it is also, and this is just for fun, um, contagious to pets. There is today an obesity epidemic among cats and dogs. So it is really a large world problem, I'm just gonna st stop here, that has a big important financial consequences. There are the costs to the people who pay for healthcare. There are the costs to the individuals. So this is U.S. data, uh, and uh, it means you know having uh, spending more money on food and dieting, etc. There's also cost to the employers. And as a business school professor, and we are here in the business uh, world, uh, these are serious costs in terms of uh, absenteeism, disability, etc., etc. At the end of the day, someone has to pay that price. Okay? And it's not surprising that governments are now giving the bill to the food companies with, with lots of good reasons. Because in fact, like uh, Matilde said, it's not all the marketers' fault, but it's also part of it their fault. Um, when you're thinking about obesity, at a very basic level, it's simple. It's calorie in, calorie out. So there is energy intake, energy expenditures. For many years, the food industry said, it's not our fault, it's because kids are not moving enough. Of course, it's true at some level. Um, and there are anecdotes, 
showing how even you see these fit, healthy guys taking the elevator instead of walking. And it's really impressive when you realize where they're going. You may have seen this photo, but they're taking the escalator to go to the gym. <laughs> so, uh, but that actually is not the real problem. Because the number of people who exercise is actually going up, and obesity is going up. If you are exercising, it's great, you should do it. But it's not, not actually a great way to lose weight. So it's the, not the calorie out, it's the calorie in that's the problem. Now the question is, you know, maybe it's what we eat. So if you look at the diet uh, 50 years ago and the diet now, yes, there are some changes. We eat a bit less grain, more sugar and fat. But really, what is the number one big change? Just the amount. 30% increase in energy intake. That's it. You don't need to really go much beyond that to realize that the problem is calories in. And this is, again, so this is U.S. data, but it's true all over the world. The world is becoming richer, which is a good thing. But one of the consequences is that even in places like Africa or China, etc., they're moving very quickly from malnutrition to overnutrition. They're consuming more calories, especially liquid calories, calories from beverages. Why? Well, because if you take a long-term view, uh, from an evolutionary point of view, uh, until our species started about 200,000 years ago, and uh, until uh, you know, recently, there was only one thing you could drink, water. Okay, milk for, for babies. But you know, now, since the invention of uh, fantastic products like beer or wine 8,000 years ago, and uh, coffee, Coca-Cola, and Pisco, you know, today we have fantastic beverages that are delicious and full of calories. And so that's why, from an evolutionary point of view, today obesity is a normal response to an abnormal environment. Our bodies haven't been meant to process calories from beverage. And uh, so there's clearly a responsibility to the supply of food. Advertising. So you could advertise, tell people it's a big deal, be careful. But you will always be overpowered by uh, the uh, size of the food industry. So you can see here next to uh, the, uh, uh, the public announcement, here says, you know, um, a fast food company. And the ingenuity of uh, food marketers has no limits. So here you can see you cannot even zap out or remove that ad because it's just everywhere. So there is no question uh, that uh, uh, the food company has had a role, and that's why today, this is just an example in England, uh, everyone is uh, focusing on the food industry to change. And they say it's their fault, uh, we need to ban, we need to tax, we need to re regulate, etc. So the food industry now is finally ready to do something. The question is what? What can they do? And so there's a question that I get a lot when I present my work, especially in uh, medical schools and nutritionists, etc. People come to me and say, you're a professor of marketing. Tell me this. Explain to me. Why can't PepsiCo uh, and uh, Nestle and Kraft and all of these, why can't they just sell healthier food? And uh, you know what is the common point among all of the people who think it is as easy as that? In one word, all these people are childless. Because when you have children, you realize it's not so simple. So what I'm going to show you here is a really cute video of hidden camera. Uh, it's soon Halloween, so kids, of course, want their candies. And here's a video of children responding to the idea that they will have healthy Halloween candies. Ready? Okay. Well, we're going to replace calories? candy with some healthy Halloween treats today. These are called veggie fruit chews, guys. This is the most worst I ever tasted. Not good. Mine tastes like broccoli. Yeah, mine tastes like poo poo. Kind of good, kind of bad. Be honest with me, Adriana. It's bad. We have asparagus flavor, beet flavor, vitamin A and D. Hey, you're saying disgusting stuff is good stuff. And it's disgusting. You're going to love these healthy nori pops. Nori pops? It also has a fibrous quality, which is going to get your colon going in the morning. They're disgusting. These are tofu ghost mellows. Uh, they taste like rotten dough. What about artichoke buttercups? <laughs> I threw up. You threw up? Okay. 
<laughs> They're delicious, healthy cupcakes. It tastes like poopy pinata. Count riboflavin. B12, B12 is like the best treat you can get on Halloween. It's like the worst thing I've ever tasted. I think I need water. These are the treats that are replacing candy on Halloween. How do you like Halloween without candy? I want candies. I mean, I have my daughter who is here. I mean, um, I'm sure if we try this at home, uh, replacing uh, candies with uh, something healthy, it would be the same. And so this is the problem. You know, uh, in, for example, cereals, they try that. These are the old traditional versions with lots of sugar and artificial colors. They said, OK, let's go reduce sugar and without artificial colors. And guess what? Nothing. They didn't sell any. So quickly, they went back to, hey, new 10 grams of sugar, and they're back, all the uh, really radioactive colors that are really not natural at all. Because, you know, let's be honest, if you're buying tricks, Fruit Loops, etc., you don't really care so much about health. You know, it's very easy to underestimate the power of taste. You know, when people buy food, it's taste, taste, and taste, and price and convenience, and health is only something that matters for people, a few people, typically the most educated, richest people, who are already healthy themselves. So if you really want to change people's behavior and you focus on health, you're probably going to be rejected by the vast majority of the people who actually need it most because they don't care really about health with food. So what do we do? There's a second problem as well if you're trying to uh, just reformulate the food to make it healthier. And it's illustrated by this uh, photo here. You see the teacher. She is explaining to the kids, the world of food can be separated into two. You have on the left-hand side all the bad food, candy, chocolate, uh, cake, ice cream, which is all the food I love. And on the right side, all the good food, broccoli, sushi, carrots, etc., which is all the food that I don't like so much, and most people don't. And it's true, of course, there are good food and bad foods. The problem with this approach, focusing on what we eat, binary, good and bad, is that actually it's enough for food to claim to be good on one aspect, for the food to be categorized as good, and then you, what happens when people think the food is good? They eat more of it. I call this a health halo effect. And to uh, illustrate how I tested this in France and in the US, I run this study using chocolate candies, M&Ms. You actually, um, we gave people regular M&Ms, and we call them either regular, or actually you can go on the website and you print on them. Usually people print, I love you, happy birthday, but we're marketing professors, we're a bit weird. We printed on the M&Ms, low fat, diet, light. Now, that's not such thing as diet M&Ms. They were regular M&Ms. And when then we looked at how much people serve themselves. So we did this study, for, uh, we created it for French television, but you'll see the subtitles. And then I'll tell you the results of the real study. Chandon propose à la moitié des volontaires de prendre des bonbons classiques. La plupart choisissent de petites quantités. L'autre moitié doit piocher dans le saladier allégé. Et là, il se lâche. People, when they were called light, they actually um, went and took the cup and dunked in in the bowl directly, which we didn't anticipate it would happen. So when they were called regular, people took on average 192 calories. When they were called light, diet, the overweight people in our sample take 46% more. And when we asked them, how many calories you think? They said, nah, same. Why? Because people said, if it's low fat, it's healthy, I can eat more. Today, people would say, if it's, low pro if it's high in protein or low gluten or low coal, it's healthy, I can eat more. And that's the problem here that we have. Uh, if we just reformulate the food, if we remove the salt, people add more salt, we haven't really made any progress. The best illustration of this health halo effect is a study that was done by a colleague, which I love, in which they asked a very simple question. They asked people, how many calories in a cheeseburger? People said cheeseburger, bad, so they exaggerate. They said 600 calories, an exaggeration. How many calories in a side salad? People thought 
89. Total, 680 something. Okay? Now, other people were asked, how many calories in the combo? The cheeseburger plus the salad. What do you think happened? People said 511. So the combo of the cheeseburger plus the salad has fewer calories than the cheeseburger alone. Adding the salad to the cheeseburger takes the calories away from the cheeseburgers. It's a concept of negative calorie. Now, why are people thinking that? Because they think good food, bad food. Good calories, bad calories, they average out. In reality, of course, they don't, they add up. Which is why, you know, we always add a cherry on top of the chocolate cake because we think it's going to suck up the calories on the chocolate cake. So all of this illustrates the problem with just focusing on improving the food itself. And um, the question is, I'm not saying this is a bad idea. I think it's good to reformulate the food, etc. But if we just do that, we're not going to be able to do a lot of progress. Some people will reject the food, some people will overeat. So what do we do? So of course, what governments always think about is education. And um, I think it's a very good idea to think about education in general. I'm a professor, you know, I care about that. But uh, in the food domain, it's complicated. Just last month, I finished a paper where we compared in France four different labels. This is like the British multiple traffic lights label. Uh, this is uh, four different labels, colors, etc. It was a big study. For three months, we, we put labels, 1.9 million labels in 60 supermarkets. We tracked the purchases of uh, you know, 170,000 shoppers, millions of purchases. Big, big study, okay? And very small effects. Tiny, tiny effects. What happened was that these labels, they helped a little bit the purchase of the good food, which is good. But they had no effect on the purchase of the bad food. Zero, nothing. Why? In fact, some of these labels, they increase the purchase of the unhealthy food. You know why? Because they are very confusing. There's a lot of information. Plus, it's not true that people just want to eat healthy. If they see a lot of red, they think the food is going to be tasty. So, no effect on low nutrition quality food. Average effect on the average nutritional quality, 1.6%, 2.6% at best. So, we should do it because education is a right, but we should not expect really big effects. And also, we need to do it well, which is why I think what's happened in Chile and what's happened in Peru is very interesting. Notice the difference here, as you all, of course, know. Here, it's very simple. Just one octagon. It's very visual. It's black. And um, when um, it's compulsory on all the food. It's very different from this rainbow here, okay? And the study, uh, that was not my study, it was done by these two people just last month. No one has actually shown uh, this study yet. They just emailed me the results last, uh, on, on Sunday. They looked at what happened in Chile. And they looked at uh, three categories, beverages, breakfast, cereals, and desserts, where you had 63% products with a label for sodas, up until 90% for desserts. And they looked at what happened short-term and long-term. So short-term, one month after the introduction, long-term, six months later. And uh, first, if you look at the label products, the products with the octagons, what they found was that it actually worked. There was a 6.6% decrease in the purchases of those products after one month, and even after six months, minus 5%. So you could say it's not big, or you could say it's actually a much bigger effect than the other uh, that we found. Uh, it's the, the problem is that not everybody responds the same way. So, first of all, they looked at social class, and as usual, there was no effect among the lower class. There was a bigger effect among the middle class, uh, and um, they didn't have enough data to really look at the upper class anyway. Um, and there was a bigger effect among families with children, which makes sense because you care about food more than when you have, when you have children. 
Um, and if you look at now the purchases of the unlabeled products, the other, the good food, what they found was a, a positive effects, both short term and long term. And uh, here the effects were true for about everybody. So this is very encouraging. It is also very encouraging because the goal of these labels is not so much to change people's behavior, which is hard, but to change the behavior of the marketers. Because when they see the labels, they want to you know, improve the food. So I think this is good, but we need to be honest and realize this will not solve all the problem. It's also something that's probably bad for some companies. So it's not surprised they will resist and lobby, etc. So the question is, you know, what else can we do? And first of all, is this, can we generalize? So what I did was, um, this is, I did a study, we looked at studies of studies. We had uh, 86 um, uh, studies uh, around the world. And we look at all of these nudges that are about informing people. Labeling, just calorie information, labeling plus color, smiley, or just putting the healthy food in a visible way. Overall, the effect, the maximum effect you can expect is a reduction in calories equivalent of five, seven, nine sugar cubes a day. It's not zero, but not so big. Why? Because again, people, many people don't just buy the healthiest food. They think about the tasty food. So what else can we do? We looked at two other kinds of nudges, interventions. Nudges that are effective, because they don't talk about your brain, but about your heart. For example, instead of selling the, the fruits and vegetables based on health, which is long-term rational, you sell them based on pleasure. You call them dynamite beets or citrus glazed delicious carrots. And then you see the effects is twice as large as just talking about health. Or you can use also uh, the help of the uh, cashiers, the lunch ladies in school, that are actually going to motivate people by saying, hey, the kids, this doesn't look so healthy. Would you want to change that? So you move from information to affect. But the most powerful effect is actually to work directly on behavior. They, I have the hands here because that's, you know, manipulate. We don't, we try to change behavior directly without needing to inform or persuade people. How do we do that? Two ways. One way, convenience. So, for example, if you take the um, fruits and vegetables, it's work. You need to peel them, you need to cut them, etc. So what you can do is you put them pre-peeled, pre-cut directly in the plate, in the cafeteria, in the canteen, or in the supermarkets. Uh, you make the healthy food at the beginning of the cafeteria line. You can, you, you're not banning the desserts. People can still have a dessert, but if they're in the cafeteria and their tray is full of healthy food, then it's inconvenient to have to go back, put it back uh, where, you, where you bought it. So this is based on convenience. And the most effective uh, method, the one that really works all the time, is to work on the size of the portion. So for example, if you reduce the, uh, the size of the cups, the size of the plates, uh, if you reduce the portion within reason, you know, 30, 20%, you will see a, a big decrease in the amount of food people eat. So everything that I'm going to show you now is about let's go move beyond education and information to use affect, emotion, and to use this behavior to make people eat better. I'm going to fast forward here. So the approach that I'm championing here is to move from improving what we eat to improving how we eat how much we eat, and I call this approach Epicurean. Why? Because the Greek philosopher Epicurus here, he already knew it. 2,300 years ago, he wrote this famous advice to his friend Menesir in the letter. He said, the wise person doesn't choose the largest amount of food, but the most pleasing. So the idea is we move from quantity to quality. We reduce portion size, less size, more pleasure. 
And I believe this is really an interesting uh, area because it's a win-win for business and health, as I will explain in a moment. So there really are two aspects. The first one is reducing size. This is an ad that, that, uh, that is found in the Coca-Cola Museum from the 60s. They say new big 16 ounce size. 16 ounce, 44 centiliters. It was deemed to be big enough for three adults. Today, here's an ad, 16 ounces, they call it small. It was big enough for three, now it's small for one. If you go to a fast food restaurant, you choose between small, medium, large. The small one has a kid here. So if you're an adult, you choose between medium and large. The thing you don't realize is that the kid's portion in a fast food restaurant today is bigger than what used to be a regular portion for an adult for the first 60 years of Coke and Pepsi. I remember as a kid, you had 19 centimeters. That was it. Secondly, small, medium, large doesn't mean anything. This was in France. If you go to the US, a medium size in the US is bigger than a large size in France. And that's not the end of it. If you go to the small uh, convenience stores, uh, like 7-Eleven, they introduced in the 80s the big gulp. People were laughing, saying, you know, one liter for a portion, that's too much. But it was so successful that they soon introduced the super big gulp and then the double gulp. So what we have here, we went from 19 centiliters to 190, multiplied by 10. And this changes everything. Because even if you are not going to think this is a normal size, the simple fact that it exists, it changes our perception of what is a normal size. And here's the thing that's really important. We as consumers, we have strong preferences for what to eat. But we don't really know how much. We want a normal. Now, normal doesn't mean anything anymore. By the way, from a marketing point of view, you might ask, why did it stop here? Why not bigger? You know why? Because the cost of the plastic, <laughs> container cost. So what is the solution? Bring your own container. So 7-Eleven did this promotion where people could have um, as much as they wanted if they brought a big container. And this is what happened. This was for the smoothie, the slurpees. Uh, people took a rice cooker, a jerry can, and even a kiddie pool. This is reality today. All right. So. Portions have increased a lot, but when you're trying to downsize portions, for example, they try to reduce the portions of Toblerone, people rebel. It goes on TV, people make memes and jokes. Uh, this here, this Photoshop, it was on the night Donald Trump was elected. A big deal, right? <laughs> well, and that night, he got 4,000 likes just for this because people thought it was actually more important than the election of the president. So this is the problem, okay? Portions have increased. People don't care. When you decrease, people hate it. Why? So this is us as a researcher, we're trying to understand why. Now, of course, no one likes a reduction, but why are they responding so negatively? So a lot of the work that I've done is to show that we are really bad at estimating quantities. Or we're bad, we're bad at uh, estimating volumes. Or eyes are bad, it's a visual illusion. Let me explain what I mean by that. Imagine that you have in front of you these quantities here of M&Ms. They are in front of you, and you see a small, a medium, large, extra large, etc. I'm telling you here there are 37 M&Ms, okay? And I'm asking you, how many M&Ms here in the small, the medium, the large? You just try to think about it yourself. How many do you think? Here on the x-axis is the truth, the number of M&Ms in the cups. Okay? And in the y-axis is the perception. If people are unbiased, on average, it should, the average should follow the 45-degree line. Okay? And these are the results. On average, people thought that the biggest one here contained about 300 M&Ms. In reality, it contained about 600. 296, the reality is almost 600. 
So even though people were trying really hard to find the answer, it's a visual illusion. We don't see the increase. It's something that is true in general. If you take, um, for example, an apple or an orange, and you increase the diameter by 26%, you have double the volume. Because 1.26 to the cube is 2. It just doesn't look to your eyes like that. If you take a 2 carat diamond, it doesn't look twice as big as a 1 carat diamond. It looks 70% bigger. Our eyes are bad at estimating increase. We underestimate the increase big time. Here, you multiply this by 16 or something, and people think you multiply it by 8. Anyway, so this is why we underestimate the big portion. However, when is the opposite? When we start from the big one, and I'm telling you there are about 600 m &Ms, and you have to do the same for decreasing portions, okay? then it's a totally different story. When we did this, you can see the results in blue. Here, people estimated the small one contained 38 m &Ms. They were totally accurate. So people underestimate the increase, and and estimate very well the decrease. That explains why we, we respond so badly to the decrease and we don't care about the increase. Why is that, by the way? Well, we realize we found the answer. When something increases, you know the starting point, but you don't know the end. It could go to infinity, and sometimes it looks like it does. When it's decreasing, you know the starting point, 600, but you also know it cannot be less than zero, right? So you have two points it becomes easier to estimate, and you're more accurate. So this is how you know, research is uh, explaining a phenomenon. But the next step is, how do we use that to actually help the marketers reduce to go back to normal size? And the answer is we use what we learn about how we estimate size. For example, typically marketers, when they have a large size like this, a large tube, they will reduce it by just cutting the height. And so this is a study. We say the large cube is this. How many grams on the small, on the medium and the small. And people, when you just cut one dimension, just the height, they're very accurate, like I showed you before. Okay? So people realize, oh, yeah, this is 50 grams only. That's too small. I want the middle one. So this is a problem. So what can we do? Well, we can use the biases in estimation of volume. For example, instead of just reducing the height, you shrink the diameter and reduce the height. As a result, you don't need to reduce the height so much. And when you do that, people think the small one has 70 grams, as opposed to 50, a 40% difference. As a result, they don't realize how small it is, and they're more likely to choose it. But the best is to come. What we found is that if you actually shrink by elongation, this is a big one, this is a small one. It doesn't look small. We find that uh, we can reduce by up to 24% without people noticing. That's why, for example, if you go from the regular Coca-Cola can to the Red Bull Slim can, you can reduce from 33 to 25 centiliters, and it doesn't look like it's less. So these are, for example, very practical, concrete solutions that uh, I, I, I am explaining food manufacturers could use to go back to the regular sizes of before. And there are lots of different things that we can do, um, but uh, another one is to say, what is the normal portion? So let's go back to the fast food example again. Imagine that... Um, you have to choose between small, medium, large, extra large. And what could companies do? Well, they could remove the big one here, or they could remove the small one. You still have people the option to um, drink as much as they want, because they can buy two of the small one or the big one if they want to. But the result is really big difference. Because again, remember, people want a normal. They want a medium. If the medium is 65, they will drink more. If the medium is 47 centiliters, they will drink less. To prove this, well, what we did was, we first asked this choice and then this one. 
And then we look at what people did. So those who chose 24 centiliters, now it's no longer available. They're still thirsty. They all upsize. Makes sense. More interestingly is to think about people who chose 47 centiliters. It is still available. Okay? So if they had a real preference for that quantity, you would see no difference. But this is what we found. One third of these people upsize from 47 to 65, which is plus 50%. Why? Because actually what they wanted was a medium. This was a medium. If you remove the small, it becomes a small. And people don't want a small, they want a regular. So what can you do? Well, you reintroduce a small one here in the line. Even if no one chooses it, the simple fact that it's there will redefine what people think is the normal size. They'll be more likely to choose a small and pay more for this. So there are lots of things I don't want to show you all of this because it's, um, I think you get the idea. The idea is uh, we try to make, we try to help people go back to normal sizes by using our understanding of visual perception. That's less size. And the final approach, and the one that I find the most exciting myself, is um, to use pleasure, not nutrition, as the ally of healthy eating, of moderate eating. Using pleasure and senses uh, to make people happier with less food. Okay, how, what do I mean by that? Today, again, when we're trying to convince people to be more moderate in the choice of quantity, we use health or nutrition. This is an, an ad for New York City. And they're telling you, look, sizes have increased, like I showed you before. Okay? Portions have grown. And so has type 2 diabetes, which can lead to amputation. That's true. So they say, cut your portions, cut your risk, or we're going to have to cut your leg. Okay? So that's a very um, strong and direct fear appeal. They're trying to scare you. Now, problem is, number one, it's unlikely to work. Number two, do you think you'll get the restaurants to collaborate and put this in their restaurants? Imagine you go to a um, fast food restaurant and they say, hey, would you like to supersize this? And one day we have to cut your leg. I don't think they will do it. Okay? So the question that I'm asking is the following. Can we find an alternative way? An alternative argument that's not based on cutting legs or medical or nutrition, but based on pleasure to persuade people themselves to choose to downsize, which is what we want. Can we find a way that can improve both health, business, and eating pleasure? Because I'm a big believer here that the only way we can have an impact in the world is to work with business. Food is not sold by governments. It's sold by private companies. These private companies, they're not there to make people fat. They just want to make a living. They just want to continue to grow. And um, if we just think about fighting against them, I don't think we're going to go very far. We need to find a way to find win-win. It's not easy, but this is one way. Okay, so, but what is the way? This is the key uh, theory here. It's not complicated. When you're thinking about small, medium, and large, or you're thinking about, do I want a dessert at the end of a nice meal? Do I want you know, a big portion, or maybe I share with my uh, partner, or maybe I take a cafe gourmand like we had yesterday in this great restaurant? Um, what's going on is um, most of today's marketing makes you want to go for the big. Why? Because, for example, you'd focus on value for money. I don't know about you, but if you uh, or go to a movie theater and you buy the small portion of popcorn, you're thinking that it's so expensive. Uh, for a few cents more, I can get a bigger one, right? And also, if you're thinking about hunger, I say, oh, maybe I will still be hungry. Let's go for the big one. 
So today we focus our marketing on price and on hunger. And as a result, everyone takes the big one just in case. Question is, what can we do? What is the argument that is actually diminishing with size? And the thing is, it's, the answer is pleasure. This is the key here. We all know when we think about this chocolate cake, we all know that the first bite is the most pleasurable, like wow, you know. You, you. The second bite is still pleasurable, but a bit less. After that, it goes down. If you have a big portion, the last bite, honestly, is not very pleasing. So with that, we know that. The thing that we don't know is that the last bite determines the overall pleasure evaluation. Pleasure in food is not the sum of the pleasure from each bite, but the average. That last bite of chocolate cake that doesn't really taste great is not adding a little bit of pleasure. It's subtracting, pulling it down. And that's why we always regret it, right? The last bite of chocolate cake, we always regret. We always say, oh, I should have not had this. So the thing is, we all know this, but we forget about this. So the, the, the idea is very simple. We want people to think about pleasure when they choose between small, medium, and large, not just about price or hunger. We want kids to do that. We want adults to do that. That's the, the, the idea. In practice, how do we do it? I will show you two ways. One that we did with children in school, but also works with adults, and, and then uh, another one in restaurants. So this is a study we did in school with children aged eight to nine, a bit like uh, my daughter who is here, and actually I, I tested that uh, on her. Uh, and uh, the idea is very simple. We want, people, we want children to think again about how it feels when they're eating a dessert. So the idea was the teacher asked the children, remember last time you had those uh, chocolate uh, cookies, wafers, or this um, um, cereals, chocolate cereals, like, or, or these candies? How did it taste? What was the texture, the flavors, the aromas? And the children, they remember, yes, I remember it was crunchy, etc., etc. It's easy, actually, using the five senses. We had a control condition. In the control condition, because you know, we need to have a control comparison point, we also asked the children about the five senses, but not in the food domain. We asked, remember when uh, you're going to the beach and you have the sand and the sun on your skin? You know, what does it uh, feel like when you walk on dead leaves? So this, of course, you know, something we did in France. Or snow, uh, when you are the feeling of the snow, or you're trying to eat a snowflake. And the kids can tell you what it feels like, but it's not about food. So it's not making them think about eating. And then what we did, then we make them choose between three portions of food. Regular, 50% bigger, and 50% again bigger. For brownies and for applesauce. So in France, it's very common for um, the um, snack, goûter, to have applesauce in the pouch. Um, for example. And we use that because we want our training to encourage kids to use less chocolate cake, but we don't want this to reduce the amount of fruits they are eating, because that fruit is good. And, uh, and that's, this is what we found. For a chocolate brownie, we found that in the control condition, the kids, on average, they took 2.16 times the regular size because they were really hungry. But when we describe the sensory imagery of eating, then they ate uh, 22 calories less. It's not a huge effect, but it's one that works during one year of study. So it's consistent. And for applesauce, first of all, they ate less of it, but there was no negative effect. The question is why? Well, we actually find that as a species, as humans, we're used to fruits and vegetables. We can predict well 
how we will enjoy it, different sizes. The problem is with all the superfood, processed food, that is a calorie bomb, we don't really realize how, how it's going to taste like. And our intervention helps the children better anticipate how they will respond. And they realize like, you know what? I don't need to have the really, really big one. This one is going to be good enough. So here's uh, some evidence that for children, we were able to make them choose a smaller size. Now, how about adults in the business context? So we ran this study, and when I'm just highlighting one, but we did many, many, many studies in many different places, uh, in a real cafeteria, in a real, uh, it's a workplace cafeteria restaurant. It's not high-end, it's a regular uh, cafeteria. Uh, the people paid 15 euros, about $15, to, for a menu, which was a special menu, which was an all-you-can-eat buffet, okay, with small uh, portions. So, for example, for dessert, they had this lemon tart. The waiter showed them the lemon tart, and they said how many they wanted. How many of uh, this uh, shepherd's pie, and this is very French, quenelle. Uh, and we had three conditions, either a um, regular menu, or a nutrition menu. On the menu, I will show you, we had calorie and fat information, like it is mandatory now in some countries. And then we have the sensory menu, the Epicurean menu, which described the food in a very poetic, multi-sensory way, talking about different tastes, textures, flavors, aromas, etc. This is the menu, it's in French, you don't need to read it. This is the little po poem about the food, uh, how it's so delicious food. This was very simple, basic, frozen food, actually, okay. Um, not like the food uh, that we ate yesterday. And this is the one, sorry, with the uh, calorie information, okay. And these are the results. In the control condition of a regular menu, people chose and ate about 1,000 calories. Okay, fine. And uh, in the sensory menu, they chose 16% less, which is, you know, the, the sweet spot. It is significant, but not too much. We don't want people to be hungry, okay? We just want people to eat, be more reasonable. In the nutrition menu, it worked too well. Reduction by 30%. I suspect that some of the participants they were so hungry, they stopped at McDonald's on the way back home. <laughs> because that's not what we want, you know, as a business. Also, because when we ask them at the end, how good was the meal? How satisfied are you? How much do you think it's worth? In the control condition, they said worth 17 euros. Remember, they paid 15. Okay, there's some surplus, everyone is happy. In the sensory condition, they chose a smaller meal, remember? But they said the overall experience was worth 20 euros. So the sensory Epicurean menu made people choose less food and pay more. The nutrition menu, that really reduced how much people uh, uh, ate, they also reduced how much they enjoyed it. It led people to say, you know what? It was not worth more than 15 dollars euros. And some people were really upset. People who were in groups who came to have a good time, they said, I'm never coming back to this restaurant. So that's not good for business. So you cannot expect that a for-profit restaurant is going to do that on their own. You have to force them. The, the value of the uh, sensory Epicurean uh, approach is that it's a win-win because there is less food and more value. And um, that's uh, really uh, why I want to uh, conclude. When I'm telling all the food industry, and they're really willing to listen now because they're scared, is that today they act as if they're not in the food business, but in energy business, like oil and gas, selling calories, making more money by selling more calories to more people more often, Quantity, quantity, volume, volume. And they need to move from a food as fuel model to food as pleasure. From the uh, oil and gas to Epicurus, the Greek philosopher. 
who said, remember, that the wise person or the wise company doesn't just sell the largest amount of food, but the most pleasing. So the idea is we move from value for money and price to pleasure, from quality to quantity, from volume metrics to other types of metrics. And if you do that, I think in addition to everything else we discussed, we can answer the question, can food marketing not make people fat with a very strong yes? Yes, it can, but it requires a new business model. And it requires also something really important, which is collaboration between government, business, and academia, which is exactly, I think, what uh, Pacific University is trying to do with the, the Clare Center, which is uh, why I'm so honored to be here with you today to share what I think is going to be just the, hopefully the first step in a, in a longer collaboration. And uh, if you're interested in this topic, you can go to the website. I think there will be uh, there's um, uh, videos and blogs and examples. And um, I think I will stop here because uh, it's now time for food. And uh, I will thank you again very much for your attention and um, for your really strong welcome. Um, it's uh, been a pleasure being with you tonight. Thank you. Muchas gracias a todos por su asistencia. Los invitamos a acompañarnos en un brindis en honor de nuestro nuevo profesor honorario en el hall, en el primer nivel. Muchas gracias. Thank you.